Now on to our presenter, Ronald L. Toon, FAIA Lead AP, President and CEO, L. Toon Strategic. Ronald L. Toon is a Los Angeles native, an architect who came to the profession by, an, by accident of high school counseling. He received his bachelor's in architecture, studying under the ecologist Ralph Knowles and case study architect Perry Cohen and his Master's of Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania, where he studied with gold medalist Louise Kahn and landscape architect Ian McCarg. Having served as AIA Los Angeles President and AIA California Board, he was elected to serve the 1998 AIA National President. Working early in his career for AC Martin and Frank Gehry, he founded El Toon Plus Porter Architects in 1984, later renamed El Toon Partners. Having divested from the practice after 30 years, according to their exit plan, he founded, which you would have learned about last week, um, founded Altoon Strategic to advise on investor developer side. In assessing Altoon Partners' hit rate of completed projects, he found there were unexpected and obscure landmines no professor ever mentioned in school that caused many projects to evaporate before their very eyes. Here to here is he is here to share those misfortunes candidly with you, believing that forewarned is forearmed. Okay, now I will hand it over the mic to Ronald. Thanks for being here, everyone. Thank you so much, Kareem, uh, and welcome everyone. Good morning. Um, all in all, I've had an arguably successful career as an architect. Some were surprised at the way my partners and I took a small startup three-person local firm and made it national on the very first day and international in seven years, ultimately working on projects in over 46 foreign countries with offshore offices in Amsterdam and Shanghai. Some appreciate how we've been able to diversify our practice clientele, moving from a limited commercial retail base to ultimately include historic preservation, adaptive reuse, higher education, transit, mixed use, transit-oriented development, high-rise residential and civic uses. Others are surprised at the amount of time we dedicated giving back to education, the profession, industry, community, and humanitarian efforts, and in writing and lecturing, still building extraordinary projects worldwide. But with all the successes, there are a host of, shall we say, failures that baffled us when we assessed our hit rate. They were successfully designed in projects which will never be realized. Well, in school, no one ever told us that the practice of architecture was like being ready to hit a Clayton Kershaw fastball out of the park, swinging wildly as the object of your imagination and affection simply whisks by you and leaves you twisted like a coil, cursing and talking to yourself. No one ever mentioned that one's career embodied the committing, uh, committing enormous amounts of human energy with built up anticipation, self-sacrificing toil, squandered creativity and severe emotional depression. No one ever told us of the minefields we would have to patiently navigate on tender toes to realize our dreams. We were all supposed to build our designs, particularly when they were inspired, on budget, well received by our clients. There are more reasons. Uh, oh goodness! And I, let me get here. There we go. There are more reasons than one could possibly imagine why even serious and seemingly successful projects could never see the light of day. It's just that students never learn about this in architecture school. It's far too demoralizing. So here it is, the bitter reality. Simon and Garfunkel sang the song, there are 50 ways to leave your lover. So too, there are at least 50 ways to lose your project. Today, we'll explore some of these landmines, but just to set the record straight and to give you a 2020 vision of our 50 ways list, 15 were from three previous practices for me, an early one where I cut my teeth, two where I was managing principal, and 12 when I was principal for design for eight years, and 35 were projects of Altoon and Porter Architects, later Altoon Partners. And just to set the record even straighter still, possibly only two of them might have been the architect's fault, but only two. The rest were, shall we say, to be kind, karma. So here we go. This is gonna be rapid face. These are the learning objectives. You will know about those already, so I'll just jump in. So way one, a donor withheld $30 million. 
you're looking at UCLA Health Sciences Center here that we designed. I designed this parking structure when I was at Dan Dworsky's office. And the donor of this building was donated another building on the site right next to it, the open site, for his to be named after his wife. And after seeing the design of this building, he told the chancellor he would withhold the $5 million he was going to pay for that building and the $25 million endowment unless we moved our building. So this building is built now, but it's built uh, curtailed with the nose cut off of it over here in order to satisfy um, that mandate. When I was at Frank Gehry's office, we had a client in, in, in the Chicago area that wasn't paying his bills and I flew back to meet with him and, and review everything. And before I left, I said, if he didn't pay his bill by wire transfer the next day, which would have been Friday, we would file a lien. On Friday, we got the wire transfer. On Monday, he declared bankruptcy. Better to lose a project by his bankruptcy than ours. When I was still at Frank's office, we were designing the redoing of the Hollywood Bowl because Zuman Mehta wanted to play opera at the bowl. And so it required taking down the shell and creating a whole very flexible structure where you could fly sets, lift elephants, do anything you wanted to make it work. But there was a Board of Supervisor member, Ed Edelman, who came to a review with Zubin Mehta and Ernest Fleischman and Frank, where the lights were turned dark so we could convince him of doing this project. After 20 minutes in the dark, we asked him, Ed, what do you think? And Ed didn't reply at all. We said, my goodness, come on, Ed, speak up. We need to hear from you. Not a word. We said, the man's fallen asleep. We turned on the lights and he had slipped out. He had gone to renew his driver's license. Zubin Mehta walked out the door, was mad, said, Ernest, I'm retiring from this orchestra. I'm going to New York. I'm going to head the New York Symphony. We lost the project. The city lost a great conductor. A fourth way they don't talk about is your client might drink too much. This is a house I designed for a Saudi Arabian prince. It's 47,000 square feet. We had designed the building. We had designed all the interiors. We were fully, we had construction documents ready to go. The client went to London went to the casinos, got drunk, lost $3 million. The king heard about it, called him home and canceled his eight and a half million dollar annual allowance. We didn't build the house. He had a brother and the brother commissioned a house. It was the same size, but this one much more uh, traditional in design to the other house. I designed this for him and presented it to him and we were that far along with him. And when his brother couldn't build his house, he as a younger brother couldn't build his house. They don't tell you about it in that in school. Their mother was a woman who was a princess who was much beloved in the country. And all of a sudden I went to make a presentation on this and another project. And while I was there, the Shah fled Iran and the Ayatollah arrived. This project died because of fear of what might happen. And the second project for her, uh, they feared an Islamic resolution and the revolution in the region. And that project didn't get built either, even though she had more than enough funds to build it because the family took their money to London. We had designed a competition for Jebel, a housing competition, which we had done exceptionally well with, but and, dis and despite the fact that we won a PA design award, it, it wasn't built because another competitor underbid this client, even though this project was remarkably sensitive in terms of its cultural uh, contextual adaptation. Also in that part of the world, a client was underbid by a competitor and our urban design plan for Yambu uh, did not go ahead. More locally, working on a project in downtown Boise, eight blocks of downtown Boise, we were doing all the renovation work on a number of historic buildings and creating an urban retail complex, which won a PA design award. This project did not go ahead, despite the fact that we held multiple, multiple, actually 24 public hearings on this, uh, six each in four different categories. We won near unanimous support of the people, but for 11 who filed a lawsuit, it went to district court in, in Boise and we won the lawsuit, but it didn't go ahead because one department store uh, did not go. Um, <laughs> way seven, uh, way 11. Um, we had a client who, who alleged that our project was too glamorous. It was a mixed-use center of office over retail, very tight site, 
you can see it's a very disciplined property. Uh, everything here is on a grid. It's very normal, but he thought it was too glamorous. Have you ever been told your project was too glamorous? Here's a project for a client in, in Seoul, in Korea. He wanted an 86 story office building to be built across the river, south of the river from the city center when south of the river was a bog, it, it was nothing. And I said, why 86 stories? He said, because I'm 86 years old. I said, well, you've worked hard for your money your whole life, but you will leave your children in poverty because you will never lease an 86 story building. So I convinced him to do a, more of a composition. And instead we designed two 52 story buildings with some lower buildings for hotel, residential, retail, uh, cultural affairs. Uh, but he didn't build this because he had political enemies who hated him and they, they, they arranged that he would never get a permit to build his building. Well, here was a strange one. We were working for a, a client in Honolulu and he gave us six weeks to design and get this building into the building department uh, because they, they were changing the mayor's office. It had to be filed. So I actually literally designed this building and all of its details on the back of an envelope coming home from Hawaii late at night. We put it into construction documents immediately and we got the job done. We submitted it for a building permit and the building permit, the, the building department came back to the client and said, sir, you don't own the entire property. You own two thirds of it. But now since we were filed, we were given the opportunity to use that filing and cut the, rotate the building and redesign it to turn it to occupy only two of the three parcels. And, but it was built, but not the one that we had designed. Can you imagine your client, these smart people forgetting to buy the property? Here's one where the client overspends for a really stupid idea. This is the historic uh, power plant in the Inner Harbor in Baltimore. We had designed a retrofit of this to accommodate an urban entertainment complex, but the client overspent for this really crazy idea of this odd character. They thought that everyone in Baltimore would come back to see this three times every year and bring their friends and relatives. And we said, for what you're offering inside this box, they won't come twice. And what they sacrificed was the major dining uh, building, catering building, uh, local bar and so forth that would have energized this property uh, and everything else and a proper cinema and, and other things. And they ended up building this. We won national historic uh, 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 award for this project, uh, certification for this project uh, and got the tax credits for it. But the project died because of a really stupid idea. This is a project in downtown Indianapolis where the uh, uh, we were in a competition to design this project where there were office buildings and hotel and retail and so forth. The one department store that we needed to agree to all of this, uh, the person had a, let's say, let's just say a transactional relationship with another architect. And um, they told the owner that they would only go if that architect were selected. So we lost the project. About two years later, the other architect lost the project because they didn't, weren't able to pull it off. And a third architect was brought in who designed a very successful project. Um, and no one tells you that in the middle of designing a, a project, there'll be a land use moratorium, but there it was. Newport Beach uh, had a moratorium and they stopped all building in Newport Center. We designed a Newport Harbor Art Museum uh, for the, the Irvine Company. And um, uh, it stopped. And when it came back on, they got a, a, a new person working for the museum and he decided he wanted to bring in uh, a global architect to come and design the building because if he was gonna do something, he wanted to have fun going to Europe to, to visit those people. It doesn't tell you that a former president of the United States might be distracted from your project. This is the Bighorn Institute in Palm Desert. It, it, it contained a residence for the, the staff. It contained a museum uh, for the endangered species of bighorn sheep. It contained a science center and an education center. But President Ford, who was chairing the fundraising committee, could barely gives attention to this. And all we ever built was the residence, but the rest of this did not go ahead. No one tells you that an earthquake 11 time zones away could kill your project, <laughs> but it did. The 
Spitak earthquake in Armenia that killed 50,000 people caused the Catholicos, which is the Armenian Pope, to call the, the uh, archbishop of this diocese and to tell him to sell the property in Lake Hollywood, which overlooked Lake Hollywood and overlooked the 101 freeway and not build this cathedral that we had designed and send all the money there to help the people in need. A good cause, but it happens. And instead, now they have built a, a facility in Burbank, just opposite Woodbury University. That's actually much bigger than this. They don't tell you your client's gonna die. And they don't tell you the president of a country could be overthrown and you won't build your building. But we designed this 101 story tower for the first lady of Indonesia. We presented it to her. She loved it. It had a lot of symbolism for her country. I mean, there's a lot in here that I could go into and talk about. Uh, but she died suddenly of a heart attack about three months later. We thought maybe her husband would build it out of the funds from her private bank, Dragon Bank, but he got overthrown and we lost a 101 story bill. Imagine being a young architect with a 101 story commission that you lose because your client dies. Well, the other thing that can happen is your client can get screwed by his partner. These are four blocks of downtown Houston that tied into an existing mall in the downtown, which was failing. And we turned this into mixed juice projects. Uh, one carried a, an office building on top, one had, uh, one had hotel, one had residential, one had entertainment and so forth. And it was a wonderful mixed use project on multiple blocks, uh, about two blocks from the convention center and, and, and their new ballpark. But this didn't go ahead because our client got screwed by his partner um, and none of this ever transpired. They don't tell you that political things, tides will turn. There'll be a, uh, occasionally a city council vacancy. This is the Sherman Oaks Galleria that we had redesigned for Prudential. Uh, the, the council member was Zev Yaroslavsky and he decided to run for board of supervisors. He was successful and was elected to that. But because there was doubt of his, re, of his election, no one came forward as a candidate to run for the city council seat. So for two years, the seat was vacant. And the general rules in the council are nothing goes ahead in your council district without the council member's approval. Having none, this project died. Well, here's one with baby getting thrown out with bathwater. This was uh, the Osceola uh, development for Disney uh, in Florida near Orlando. And this was a mixed use project based on uh, da Vinci's universal uh, city plan. This is 16 blocks of a downtown uh, with all sorts of things plugging into an office and residential and hotel and a transit station feeding into it, parking, wrapping around it, service underneath it, uh, all up in the air. There were four architects involved in the overall master plan. Um, the other three of which you would know by name easily. This was presented to Disney, uh, to uh, Eisner, and he looked at it. He, he really liked this, but he didn't like the rest of it, so he threw the whole thing out. They brought back um, one of the four architects to work on the revised site, which now they had uh, um, information on for where the water was that you had to protect. We were that one architect, and we went to make a presentation, um, a pre-presentation, and they were amazed at what we had done. This was our scheme uh, for all of that, uh, new, completely new scheme. Um, but Eisner had asked them the night before we got there if all the, the four architects would deliver. And they said, we're doubtful about Altoon and Porter because they're a small firm. He said, well, then get rid of them. So we made our presentation. They loved it. Their project manager followed me out to the airport and met me in the in the, in the crown room. And he said, I'm sorry to tell you, but you've been dropped from the presentation because Eisner asked us last night if you'd hold up and we said we didn't think so, but actually you had the best scheme. Imagine that. They, they would, didn't have the guts to go back and tell Eisner that, that they were wrong. Another way is you, you can win a competition, but get replaced by a new client member. So this was a project we won by competition in Dubai. It was a retail center, office building, hotel, uh, uh, a mosque, uh, and, and other functions. Uh, 
but this new project manager who had been in the back of the room in our presentation preferred another firm that wasn't even in the competition and they ended up with the project. <laughs> they don't tell you that a vice chancellor at UCLA would get pissed off at your partner and you could lose a project, but he wasn't for the work we were doing. They were very pleased with the work. But the existing campus architect at UCLA decided to leave when a new chancellor was appointed. He, he just didn't find the same level of compatibilities he had before. And my partner had spoken to him and, and everybody was wanting to bring him aboard. He decided to come with us and the vice chancellor was angry at us. So he stopped the project. This is three of four projects we did around the old wooden center, which was a plaster box that was really like an impediment on the campus. Um, you know, they don't tell you the vice chancellor would still be angry and you wouldn't build the fourth building. And so this one didn't go ahead for us either. Um, we lost a competition because we weren't British. We were competing for a project in France. The, the uh, owner was in France, but their advisor was British and they came in and, and they said, oh, no, no, no this has to be a British firm. And so they selected a British firm instead, and we lost this despite uh, doing a really stellar job on the competition. We won by competition, the new building for the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento. Uh, this is that building. Um, and then they, the interim director was replaced by uh, a permanent director from the East Coast, and she had a buddy architect on the East Coast who ended up with the commission. They don't tell you that a very well-purposed public institution might interfere with your process. Uh, this is on Alvera Street. There's a mural on this wall above the Italian hall that David Alfaro Siqueiros, the great, one of the great uh, Mexican muralists had painted and had been whitewashed because of the subject matter. Conservancy came in. We were designing a facility that would allow you to view that but protect it from the ultraviolet rays of the sun, access it um, through an elevator here where buses would line up on the street. The top floor of this would become a museum. You could cross this roof on a bridge and sit undercover in an auditorium and learn all about the history of Los Angeles and what was going on. But the LA Conservancy in a friend of the court kind of brief uh, came to the um, cultural heritage uh, meeting and said, you know, we really like this scheme, but we'd just like to see a nuance adjustment to it. And to get back on the agenda took four months. And by then, the um, Getty Conservation Trust decided they would invest their money elsewhere. The city was going to be too, too problematic. This has been built in a fashion. I don't know who the architect was, but the whole idea of this covering, the whole idea of the access in the museum was originated in this scheme. Um, another stacked competition. You can tell by now that I am not a fan of competitions. Uh, this one was in Germany, is in Duisburg. Um, and this project, uh, we just had a wonderful time with this. And, and yet this one was stacked for uh, a European originated firm to win. Uh, we were a bit uh, tagged with being from Los Angeles, even though we had an a a Amsterdam office, uh, which was front and center in this. We also had a project we were trying to get in Leeds, and um, there were political mixed messages that were coming out from the city, and we were tagged by that because our client misunderstood what the city wanted to do. Um, we had won a competition. Our client was considering four firms. They brought each one into town for a week. We came in and did design charrette. And this project is in uh, Prague in the Czech Republic. This is the old barracks that for, housed the troops for uh, Emperor Franz Joseph. Over on the side here, there were stables that had historic trusses. We put those trusses inside on the top of this and turned it into a museum. We did a wonderful scheme for this. and. And the client loved this, but he got distracted by a lawsuit on his previous building and then brought in a guy who was taking advice from two of many other people. So this project disappeared. I went back to Prague at a conference and they were doing a tour of this facility, which has by then been built. And almost the identical scheme to what you're looking at was there. 
done by an American architect that you would know. And I was in the tour and I came by and in the tour at the end of the tour, I said, so tell me where the inspiration came for this scheme. He says, and he gave me this answer. I says, well, check our original drawings and you're gonna see this scheme. Sometimes it happens, not nice, good people make mistakes. Here's one where our client was acquired and the mayor lost re-election. This is also just outside Prague in Khodov. Uh, it was a transit-oriented development. Uh, part of this did go ahead actually, but differently than the way we designed. Um, but political change and, and company change can cause that. Here's a project we had designed for a client in Taiwan. Um, he turned out to be disreputable. We had to sue him. We, after three years, we won the lawsuit, but by then he had hidden all his money and we couldn't recover a nickel. It's the only time we ever really lost money overseas. Here's one where our client bought a bank instead of building the complex that we had designed for them. This is in Singapore. Ultimately, they did build this actually, but they built it um, later than what we anticipated and with only a portion of our concept uh, implemented. They ever tell you your client will go to prison? We've had seven of our clients go to prison while they were our clients. We are a consistent judge of character, even if not a very good judge of character, but there it is. This is a project incredible. This is about an 8 million square foot project, two office buildings, multiple residential towers. Client went to prison. We didn't build that. This is in Indonesia. And this is the second project for the same client. Notice the, the residential towers here are pretty much the same as in the last scheme. They came off construction documents that we produced for a 7.7 .7 million square foot project that we did build for the same client. He wanted us to lower our fee for these two projects. And we said, you know, we gave you a, a great deal last time. We're giving you a fair fee in this case, but he gave our construction documents to an American competitor from California who accepted them and went ahead with the project. I called the State Board of Architectural Examiners and he said, that is both a civil case and a criminal case. If you have evidence, we will go to court with you and give a friend of the court brief. We will pull the architect's license and, and we will stand behind you in your lawsuit. Well, that year I was national president of AIA and I didn't think it was in the interest of the profession to bring down an international American practice over something like that. So I just swallowed hard and let it go. But you know what? That client went to prison and that architect ate $2 million in uncollected fees. So here we are, same client. This is an early project we designed for him. And this project um, was not built because they relocated a highway. Um, here's a project we did in uh, Hong Kong for the MTRC. Uh, we won this uh, commission having interviewed against five other firms. We designed the project and all of a sudden the MTRC decided to go, go private. They were a public agency. And when they did, they decided to retender all of their projects. So, we knew how complicated this. This is the lar largest transit station in Hong Kong. And when they retendered it, someone underbid us on the project and got the project. This has been built very, very similar to what we've designed, but we lost it because the client had to save face and couldn't turn around. Our, I had a partner who was a bit inattentive to a, a client of ours, but we also had some corruption in the city at the time. And this is a large project for Boeing in, in Long Beach. Uh, part of this has been built out now, but it didn't happen for us because of those things. Um, we, had, uh, we were working with a, another design firm on its project in Colorado and an employee of his left his firm and joined a competing firm, an architectural firm and stole the design idea that we had. They landed the project and they built it. And a partner who went on vacation, we were designing the Grand Avenue plan for um, the uh, uh, Grand Avenue Commission and the uh, 
uh, LA Philharmonic. Uh, they had loved this scheme and they were really proud of it. But when the partner went on vacation, he told um, our client that if there are any questions to call the designer, not to call me. And this was from my mind, this project. And they called the designer who couldn't answer the questions they wanted and they stopped the project. Here's a project we had designed in downtown LA. We had, for a Japanese client, we went to Tokyo to make a final presentation to this. And while we were there, they mysteriously sent us to Anjuro um, um, and, and to the a guest house they had overnight and got us out of town for a full day. When we got back, we, we learned that despite the fact that we had designed this building, got six extra floors because of our historic work over here uh, and got much more value for the client than he had imagined that we were not gonna do the project because while we were in Anjiro, an American architect flew over, met with that client and told them that they would never be able to lease or build the project we designed and they believed him and we lost the job. And parenthetically, that architect lost his job later on. Um, economic instability in the Philippines killed this project. Um, competition again, there's a relationship that our a competitor of ours had with a client that was longstanding, despite having a very interesting scheme for them in Portugal, uh, we lost this project. And we lost one because of a client of fidelity. This is a wonderful project in Gresham, uh, Oregon, outside of Portland, it tied to its light rail. We put a major station here, but our client just couldn't uh, keep it tucked in and we lost the project, he left the firm. Here's one where a client shifted to design build. This is a project we designed for a Russian client uh, uh, outside Moscow. Um, but when you shift to design build, you shift with design. And here's one where the JV talks between um, our client who was um, two, two entities. One was a Moscow based would be developer who had never developed anything and a Paris based developer who partnered together and they finally got their act together. They finally came to terms with each other. They went to dinner with each other uh, at the same restaurant I happened to be in that night. And they went back to Paris and it didn't get built um, because the French received an, an email saying, you had to sign the deal last night, you didn't sign it. So we're doubling the price of the land. This died. They had built this project by the way, but when the client, dis our Paris client disappeared, all of a sudden they made some adjustments to the scheme and it took them three years longer and they've had trouble leasing it. Here's one that died because of a global condominium meltdown. This is a project we designed in Las Vegas to be the World Jewelry Center for a Beverly Hills client. It was a really wonderful project that was sold to the trade and publicly. Uh, they had condominiums for people to live in here. They had uh, offices for uh, the, the, the merchants that were here. It was presented to Mayor Goodman who loved it. It was presented to the council who loved it. The planning department loved it. Everybody loved it, but there was a global meltdown. And here's one that we lost because our client came back from the dead, sort of. We designed this project in Redmond, Washington, Redmond Town Center. It was mixed use. The hotel rooms were guaranteed 70% of the rooms, 90% of the nights by Microsoft. The city was going to put its city hall right opposite this town square. There was a little bit of office over here, a cinema underneath the town square and a retail center. But our client who had retired from his company was still on the board of the parent company, came back and said, I want to try and do another type of project on this site. In the year it took him to fail, two of the department stores pulled out because they couldn't believe it would go ahead. And this project didn't happen the way we designed. But it did get built in, in some fashion, but not like this. And about now you're thinking, this guy is a walking disaster. or he has really, really, really bad karma. So here are 50 ways to build your project. Way one, this is the Grand Way in El Segundo. This is a project that, that was started when I was with an old firm. Uh, before I started my practice. And when I left, the client asked if I would stay involved and the, they said that would be fine and I would be involved, but they weren't giving me the full information on the project. The client realized it. He said, all right, I want you to resign. And when I did, he said, okay, now I'm appointing you owner's representative. You're the client, go build your project. 
So I became the client on a project I had designed. Um, 4000 Wisconsin Avenue is in Washington, DC. It's the first project of my practice, which I landed the second day in practice. It's about a million square feet um, in Washington. It had to obey height limits and everything else. Um, but we really got it built because we went into the building department. We went into the building department and um, told them that we couldn't find any ADA uh, code issues in the building code. And they said, we don't have it here because none of the federal agencies are required to comply. So we don't, as a municipality, require it. He said, but if you will do that, right? We said, every room is ADA compliant. He said, if you will do that, then we'll get you a building permit in less than a week. Our client was in the room. He said, yes, and we built this. It's a corporate headquarter expansion to Fannie Mae. Nice first project. Um, Engie Company 28 in downtown LA, our client uh, bought this building. It's an historic building because it is. Um, he wanted it to be his uh, corporate office. We added a floor on top behind the parapet. We added three floors in the back above parking off the alley. And because we added the extra square footage, the project penciled out and it was built. Arden Fair in Sacramento was a single level, horrible sea level enclosed shopping center. Um, they wanted to expand it. Um, we said, let's build on top of the building. So we designed, strategized, and built an entire mall floor above an operating mall while it continued to operate every hour of every business day with no shop closures. To be able to strategize that and make that work was the key to making this project go ahead. There had only been one such thing ever done before, and this was the most successful. Uh, Lincolnwood Town Center in the Chicago metropolitan area, we had to convince the top dog uh, that this was the right thing to do. I went back for a meeting, the staff, all of his design and execution staff says, this is much too complicated to build and you're not gonna build it. The, the, the head of the company walked in the middle of the presentation and says, what's this? This is gorgeous, let's build it. So I said, do I take that as an approval? They said, we've, we've never heard such a positive response from him. So we built it. This is in downtown Cincinnati, it's called Tower Place. You're looking at five levels of parking above two levels here and a subterranean level of retail, you access the parking across a bridge that connects this retail to a department store on the other side of the street. We built this because we were able to build the parking affordably above the building rather than digging down below the building. This one, the Mall of Green Hills in Nashville, you'll see a lot of retail here. We built it because we understood that, that in, in the antebellum South brickwork is the architecture of choice, but inside where, where most of the shopping is done by women, we wanted a very feminine building inside. So we mixed masculine and feminine and, and built above and adjacent to this building. Queen Ka'umanu Center in Kahului, Maui um, was a one level uh, open air mall that um, uh, was anchored by two one level department stores. The client wanted us to build a second level on top of this. But of course, you're unanchored at the second level of the two stores. So we looked in the back of the property. There was a warehouse there. And we said, how much would it cost to rebuild your warehouse on the other side of your property? And they did an assessment. They said it'd take them $2 million. We said, start building. Because we can save you $11 million if we add a department store in the back where that, that is and do two levels coming forward to a food court. So we built that there. And that became this new project that became an iconic building in Hawaii that, that is based on the tall ships and where fresh air and natural uh, breezes blow through the project where it's protected from the rain, but daylight permeates this building without artificial lighting all day long. Fashion Valley in San Diego um, it was another, another overbuild. Um, this is a project that was built in the old days where Every store had a different height when they were a one level building, depending on how wide and deep it was, there were higher volumes. So the roof lines rose and fell um, like a folded plate. We designed the second floor to rise and fall above, almost like walking through a hill town. And it worked very well. The client was very happy and we built it. 
in Palm Desert, in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the desert here. Uh, this is a project that we basically said, this has to be an open air desert building to in, employ ancient outdoor comfort strategies to make this work. So all these pavers are set in sand. They are, the water goes in those uh, in the morning and the, it, it evaporates. It evaporates and um, and creates a cooling thing. The, the, the trellises are there, the drought tolerant plants are there. Uh, it's a very, very um, uh, a contextually sensitive building to the environment. This project is on a triangular slope site, very, very compressed site. And we shoehorned it into that site uh, and, and took advantage of the slopes and the odd shapes to create an interesting composition. Across the street from that um, was an old mall that had three department stores that were dying. And we suggested alternative uses for those stores and that became a viable project and a highly successful one. And this one was in San Mateo. Um, it was a, a project that used to be a, a, a racetrack, that sea biscuit right there running on the racetrack. Um, this project went ahead. I, I served as an oops, I served as an expert witness uh, in a lawsuit against BART. They won the lawsuit and it paid the entire cost of the purchase of the land and the purchase of the building. Basically, our client got a free operating property out of a lawsuit. Uh, fashion show in Las Vegas. Uh, I had a long-standing relationship um, uh, with a client. Uh, they came to us. They said, we, we have a concept for this that, that uh, Richard Orne had produced early on, um, but we need an architect to take this uh, soup to nuts. So I said, we'll take it schematics through construction administration based on that long-standing obligation. And this project was built um, a very iconic project uh, where it's on the strip in Las Vegas, but it changes its complexion by virtue of the what happens on the on the media boards and, and projected onto the cloud above. And by the way, it's 15 degrees cooler under that cloud than it is uh, out in the sunlight. Uh, a stage comes out of the floor, runway is there, they do fashion shows inside, and they can broadcast fashion shows from anywhere in the world in real time. Aurora Mall was in the Denver metropolitan area. And um, it's, it's a project that got built because we dealt with contextual issues, knowing the DNA of the locals and forming design. Victoria Gardens in Rancho Cucamonga, open air, 16 blocks of anybody's downtown. We just told the economic development director, just trust me. We did, she did. She, later on tape, she said, I recommend that to every, trust your architect, just trust them. Don't come in with preconceptions of things you know nothing about. The shops in Chino Hills, we planned a village center, not a shopping center. In Waikiki, I flew in from Honolulu, to Honolulu from Moscow to convince the planning staff I knew more about their culture than they did because they were changing staff the next day. It would be a new mayor, a new turnaround. We built this project, highly contextual. Macy's came to us to design a new prototype for them. I said, make this like a gift box. Every layer, you take off the bow, you take off the paper, you open the box, you open the crepe paper, you get to a gift. Everything reveals itself over and over. We did two of those stores. Um, this office on Wilshire Boulevard, we were the tenant. So you build your dream as a tenant. This one for MCA Universal, um, we had to think like a tenant. What would that group like to do? This one for ourselves on South Flower Street, uh, top two floors of an office building. We had to be smarter than our broker and knowledgeable about a foreign culture. In this case, uh, it's was Sumitomo Bank's North American headquarters. And I had to get inside their head and inside their CEO's head, who I never met, in order to land this space for us and build this out. Um, another way you can do that is to be your own client. And another way you can do it is the parking structure at UCLA is to understand the social context. We were at the edge of Bel Air and Holmby Hills with this building, a parking structure, multi-level structure. And we designed a structure so those neighbors would not object to the structure going there. The Arthur Ashe and Wellness Center, which is the first of those four UCLA projects, other three that I showed you, you had to understand the site forces and understand the history of place at UCLA 
in order to build this project. And that began our solid relationship with them. The second wooden north, which we had done the design work on, let the language lead the building. And the soccer field, which is under, which is on top of a parking structure, we had to deal with how you multipurpose a piece of dirt. It's a subordinated to the context. California Nanosystems Institute at UCSB, the architect for this design architect was Venturi Scott Brown. It's on the right, the white building. How did we get this? Another partner and I had gone to Penn and that's where Robert Venturi was in his heart. So that project came to us. Southwestern University School of Law Library in the historic Bullock's Wiltshire building. Um, <laughs> we had to neutralize the LA Conservancy who had called the Dean to say, why are you hiring that architect? What do they know about historic preservation? When we convinced them that they should have done their homework and we actually had done a lot of work in that area, we then invited them to be a design participant in the project. The Filippi de Nevi Branch Library was when they were giving out libraries to everybody. We had to survive seven, 14 years of this project being in our office to build 1500 new square feet. Tom and Angrek, this is the project that I mentioned before in Indonesia where the, our construction documents were given away. 7.7 .7 million square foot project, uh, 2,800, 3,500 residential units. I, I sent the client to lunch without me. I said, go away, I'm gonna design this building. We, I designed what I would live in if I was there. He wanted to design something that was terrible. He looked at it, how much more will that cost me? I said about five, maybe maybe five percent more. He said, "Okay, we designed it. These units sold out in three and a half months, all of them." Boyncock Station in Singapore, we landed because of uh, you know we we were a foreign architect, and that's what they wanted. We were brought there by a local firm, but we introduced new, new technologies to them that intrigued them. They did this, and when they liked it so much, we were hired to do the second station for them um, and said, you build this because you go bold. The other one we understated, this one we went bold. Uh, High Street, Bonifacio High Street in Manila, uh, based on a client relationship, but we built it because we appreciated the context. A lot of glare, a lot of sun. We put sunglasses on the building and protection from the rain and it made this project very viable. For the same client, uh, the terraces at Ayala Center Cebu, um, we understood the hostile climate could be your best friend if you dealt with it in a, in a, in a manner that was consistent uh, with um, indigenous ways of dealing with climate. Warren Gamal <laughs> in Sydney, I was at a conference in Geneva and you wear the, your flag on your badge so people know what language. And I was approached by a guy from Australia who just wanted to talk to someone. And I had gone to that conference to attend a specific session. And he just wouldn't let go of me like a pit bull hanging on to my pant leg. And he just, I just gave him time. I gave up. I didn't go to my session. Two years later, the guy calls me up says, do you remember me? I said, you bet I do. He says, well, I, I told you I work for an insurance company. I didn't tell you I run their entire retail, the real estate portfolio. Would Can I buy you a ticket and bring you to Australia? I wanted to show you a project. So I came to Australia, we did this project from them. We did this project for them as well. Almost got arrested taking pictures, uh, but secured the project. And we did this project in uh, New Zealand for them. Uh, because we embraced the indigenous Maori culture, understood what was important to them spiritually and culturally, and they approved this project before the city did. Central World and Bangkok came to us. <laughs> this is one you never said. This is the project that burned down. The, the, in, in, okay, part of it burned down in, in uh, Bangkok. Uh, but we built this project because a client saw what we had done in Las Vegas, loved it, and said, come and, and do something that's exciting for me. Marini, Marina City Center in Qingdao, we built because we made this, suggested making a transit-oriented development by connecting underground to a close-by uh, subway. This one, uh, Amamlaka, it's the retail portion, the bottom part, the tower is by Ellery Beckett. We did the piece down below. We designed for the culture and avoided judgment. The culture said that women shop 
90% of purchases in Saudi Arabia, but they have to shop behind a veil. So where did they go? They go to Paris and London. We say, let's take the veil off the woman and put it on the building. So here's the veil on the third floor of the handrail. The third floor is called Woman's Kingdom. Only women are allowed on that floor. No men are allowed at all. So everything from, from shoes and purpose, purses and jewelry and cosmetics and handbags, everything is there that are impulse items. The, the third floor of the Saks Fifth Avenue and Debenhams department stores are women only. So it's, and there's a business center for women, cafes and restaurants, only women. The other two floors, anyone can shop in. Uh, but we landed and built this project because we recognized the culture, got that approved by the Islamic police. Women can go there. They arri arrive up a, a ramp here and a, and, a, and a dropped off by their driver at the time. They would enter here. They could check in their abayas and they could shop in jeans and a t-shirt and all protected behind this veil, see what's going on below, but not be seen themselves. This is one in the Czech Republic in, in uh, Brno. Uh, we built this because we scaled our ambition to fit the economic reality. In Nanjing, this Taiwan trademark, uh, this is all done out of industrial materials. We transformed this aesthetic into art and built this project uh, because it was affordable. This project for the same client in an adjacent site, we just needed to stretch their imagination about what this project could become. And this one in Moscow, the Moskva collection, the word Moskva can only be used uh, on this particular site. It's, uh, it's central to the culture of the Russians. Um, this site uh, had behind the shell of an old building with 10 foot floor to floor dimensions. Retail usually has 18 feet. We made this look higher than we can psychologically with the light towers um, and then made all the surfaces reflective. So it would have a kind of a multivalent personality inside. The other idea is to make your client very wealthy first. So I built a first client for a, a project for a Russian client. He made a fortune on it, he commissioned us to do this project. Um, and we did that because we made him wealthy. The American University of Armenia in Yerevan, we landed because of kind of humanitarian payback for my leading the AIA team to Armenia after the Spitak earthquake. Um, downtown Summerlin is outside Las Vegas. We built this because we did it as an open air project. We had to be absolutely essential to our clients. We had to break all design construction speed records. We built this project in about 60% of the normal time to build a million and a half square foot property like this. Top city in Taichung, Taiwan, uh, we built because we made a shockingly transformational image. And lastly, Ho Katrina in Utrecht in, in, in the, the Netherlands, we built that project because 14 years has somehow come up again. We survived 14 years of design abuse by their building, their beauty committee, beauty committee, which is comprised of architects who give you critiques, but don't give you a chance to answer back. We, we survived that uh, and four years of construction and built this mixed use project, which includes um, residential, it includes a uh, hotel, it includes museum, retail, and everything. So that's it. That's uh, 50 ways to lose your project and 50 ways to build it. And uh, I would invite your questions at this point. Thanks, Ronald. That was amazing. Um, and like I put in the chat, please um, raise your hand or um, put your question in the chat because um, it's always fun to um, to have everyone weigh in in the morning. Um, Ronald, I we did this morning, you gave us some insight um, as to how you actually um, were able to put even this presentation together. And I know this wasn't one of your questions, but I really, I, I thought that that was an amazing process. So can you share that with us? Well, uh, a number of these images pre-exist uh, the digital world. So many of these uh, are either photographs I took or slides that we had. Uh, some of that ultimately got copied onto disks and think, tra you know, scanned and, and put on disks. So just a question of keeping records of what you've done and when you did it and, and learning from it as you do that. So 
you know, this, this lecture came about when we had moved offices and I was refiling everything because I was trying to shred the stuff we didn't need anymore. And I went through a file cabinet and I found all these files on projects that had died, that we had done wonderful renderings on, great models. And I said, geez, were we that bad? Were that, that many reasons? Why could we have lost so many wonderful projects? And as I looked at them, I realized that these weren't our fault. We didn't lose these because we screwed up. We lose these, lost these because of external events that were really beyond our control. And it just said to me, you know, young people coming into practice need to know their landmines out there and keep your eye out for them because the things you can do to protect yourself, not the least of which is never falling behind on getting paid. When we worked overseas, we always, we basically said, if, if we're good enough that you'll bring us halfway around the world, then you need to pay us because we're better than somebody in your mind where you live. So you're gonna pay us in advance, not the whole fee, but always keep us more than current and we'll work on your nickel, not ours. And that was a real lesson that came out of this for us because you know what, you can never get, you can never get a fair trial overseas. I couldn't go to London and get a fair trial if I wasn't British. Sense. Um, so we do have two questions in the chat so far. Um, John, do you want to unmute yourself or I can read your question? Oh, I, I can unmute myself. Uh, hi, Ron. Uh, great presentation again. Thank you. Um, so one of the things as a civil engineering and structural engineering consultant, we, we lose a lot of jobs because of many of the reasons you mentioned uh, that some competitor got it. And I always, I always grapple with asking about who our competitors are in that whole process of being asked about proposals. So I just wondered, is that something you did? And if you did, how did you utilize or get that information? I, every time uh, someone would ask me to submit a proposal on a project, I would ask them first, are you only talking to us or are you talking to others? They said, no, we're talking to several others. I said, I'm going to ask you to share with me who they are. They said, well, why would I do that? And I say, well, why would you not do that? Mm -hmm. The reason I think you should do that is I need to know who my competition is because I need to be able to position myself in a way that I think will convince you that I bring value that maybe they don't bring. So, I mean, most of the firms we competed against were much larger than us. And I had to put on the table why size did not matter. If I didn't raise that issue, you know, if I raised it, with just us being the only person going after, they're wondering why I'm raising it. You know, so I need to be able to raise issues that cause them to look at our assets, not to be defined by our deficits. And I'll tell you the, the, the project that we wanted, the MTRC in Hong Kong, that project, they had, they, there were six firms they were interviewing. And my partner told me going in the door that we had that interview because of him. I said, good, I don't know how you got that, but that's great. So end of our end of our interview, I said, so how was it that you how was it that you came to us? And he said, you know, we had five firms. We were required by our board to have six, and we couldn't come up with a sixth. So we start researching all the real estate conferences around the world the last five years. And you had spoken at about 40% or 50% of them. And we figured if you were good enough to speak, we should be talking to you. So at the end of it, he said, but I have one more question for you. He said, I understand you're national president of AIA this year. I knew what was coming. I knew that a competitor had planted that in their interview. He said, how are you going to have time to design our building? And I was prepared. And I said, this didn't just happen. I was elected to this position two years ago. I've been distributing the people that are growing in my firm, my responsibilities on their projects. I'm going to keep three clients this year. I've already got two. You're going to be the third. Nice. And we landed it. Thank one you. One more question? Yeah, one, or John, you're good. I'm good, thank uh, Another you. question we have from um, Haley. Haley, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Ron. Uh, this is Haley from DLR. Uh, hi. Uh, just wanted to ask about um, all the out of all the failed projects that you had or the ones that didn't go through, if there was one that was clearly that hurt the most or if there was one that you, you're really sad that didn't go through. Oh, golly. Um, 
they all hurt. Um, you know, when you've, when you've designed something you think uh, is really inspired for the area, um, it, it hurts a lot. I think the, the one that stands out in my mind was the one south of the river in Seoul, um, where it was a major mixed use, pro it was a Rockefeller Center kind of project. It was a kind of project that would have caused a whole region of the city to, to become uh, viable. And for us to lose that because the client had political enemies, I mean, so far outside our, our level of control, that really hurt. We had poured our heart into that. Um, the, the person that introduced us to that was uh, a Korean architect that worked with me, um, who uh, uh, was just a wonderful, splendid person. Uh, and he had been the campus architect of the Korean Institute of Science and Technology. And he had a sterling reputation there that opened the door, but the client did not. And he was known to be a bit of a scoundrel and that's why the project didn't go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Haley. Any other questions? Don't be intimidated. Ron's a really, Ronald's a really nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Ron. Uh, Clay Holden. Uh, great presentation. Very inspiring. Thank you. Uh, two things uh, uh, seemed uh, obvious to me during this. One is uh, you're clearly a, a pioneer in American firms working abroad. And uh, two, your fearlessness in working with developers. Um, I'm wondering in, in this climate, uh, how you view those two um, uh, work areas. This climate being COVID or this climate? Well, being... uh, let's maybe COVID aside, maybe this COVID climate aside. being uh, economic, so, socio political. Yeah. You know, I can tell you that um, uh, architecture is a very difficult profession. It's difficult because uh, a, a number of reasons uh, relationships and connections are vitally important. If you don't come to the profession with those, it's a challenge to develop those. Um, salary levels are low compared to other professions and that is another inhibitor. And the culture of uh, the profession itself, uh, which tends to undercut itself in terms of fees is also not helpful. We went overseas because uh, I just had a, a lust to work in other cultures. I just wanted to do it. And I, I, I said to myself a lot, you come into life naked, it's okay if you lose it all and go out naked. You go out with passion, you go out feeling you've done the right thing, you've done the best you can, but you can't do it if you're on defense. So for us, we went on offense. And the, the next seminar is on taking your practice global. And it will answer that question more thoroughly. But you know what? You've got to be fearless. You've got to be ambitious. You got to be passionate and you got to be really clever about how you navigate around all those issues that are essential when you have none of them going in. You just find a way to do it. You just do it. And, and I'll share that with you on the next lecture. Great. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks, Clay. Um, well, Ronald, I think everyone is off to a very busy week. Um, so just anything you'd like to wrap up, any last advice um, for young or old practitioners? Uh, it, it just to keep your eyes open. Um, there, there will be opportunities for you and there will be reasons why they are opportunities for you and not for others. Um, you need to ask the right questions coming in. You need to know, um, who's in the weeds, uh, who's not in the weeds, who, who the decision makers are, how to get to the decision makers. Uh, what I find particularly in working in the development community is the, the culture of that is that they're always working on other people's money. It's unlike doing university projects or city projects which are pre-funded before they come to your door. You design your project and then they gotta go find money to build it. And what happens is it's, design, it's assigned down the, 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 the food chain from the CEO to a head of development, to a senior development officer, to an intermediate development person. 
and that's your contact. And they are less qualified at, in their profession than you are in yours. So what's gonna happen is there's gonna be poor communication along the way, and you're gonna get tagged with the consequences of that. So you've gotta find your way to access higher up the food chain because what happens is you build your career in the development company by the rank you have and the vice president gets such a percentage of ownership in the project. Senior vice president gets more, executive vice president gets more, okay? And the only way you move up is to demonstrate that you're in total control and you never go over budget in your development budget. And if you miscommunicate the intent of the top dog, it's gonna be the architect's fault, not yours. And that's where you get burned. So there's a lot, a lot of snakes in the grass. Be careful. <laughs>